Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. Let's talk about the amazing process of gluconeogenesis. What's gluconeogenesis? Well, let's break the word up. Gluco means glucose, neo means new, genesis means the beginning of, let's read it backwards, the beginning of new glucose. Basically, this is producing glucose from non-carbohydrate based sources. Now you know that there's three macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs, and we make glucose primarily from carbs. So if we were to make glucose from non-carbohydrate based sources, that's basically making it from the proteins and the fats. So we've got the fats over here as triglycerides, we've got the proteins over here, and we're gonna talk about how they can come in to produce glucose. Now, why do we wanna produce glucose? Couple of reasons. One, the brain's only energy source is that of glucose. Now you may say to me, what about ketones? I know ketones can fuel the brain. That's true, but it's a backup energy source, and I'll talk about that very shortly. So why do we wanna produce glucose? Well, sometimes glucose is low in the body. This can happen in fasting states. So in what we call the post-absorptive state, when we need to increase our blood glucose levels back to that four to six millimoles per liter blood glucose levels that it should be at, all right? So you already know of glycolysis, where we take glucose, turn it into pyruvate, and that pyruvate then jumps into the mitochondria turns into acetyl-CoA and then undergoes the Krebs cycle to produce a whole bunch of ATP, also produces carbon dioxide, also produces hydrogen, which can go to the membrane and undergo electron transport. A lot of this happens under aerobic conditions, so there's oxygen. We also know that under anaerobic conditions, pyruvate can turn into lactate, right? Now this is reversible, so when the oxygen's back again, lactate turns back to pyruvate. But what you probably didn't know is that lactate seems to be a normal end product of this glycolysis anyway. So we know that lactate is the preferred end product in the liver and in the muscle, even at rest in the muscle, and significantly more so in active muscle. All right. So what we're saying now is we have a stimulus in our body and our stimulus is we've got low blood glucose levels. This travels to the pancreas. The pancreas has certain cells called alpha cells. They pick up this change or this drop in blood glucose and they release a hormone called glucagon. Now it also, or the body also releases cortisol and also releases noradrenaline. So glucagon, cortisol, noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine, are three stimulators of gluconeogenesis, this process we're just about to talk about. And again, what's the end goal? Stimulus, drop in glucose, what's the outcome? An increase in glucose, that's what we want. All right, so let's have a look and see what happens. So the first thing, the first non-carbohydrate based source that we're gonna look at that turns into glucose is gonna be lactate. Let's say that our muscles have produced huge amounts of lactate and now we're bringing it into the hepatocyte, so the liver cell. This lactate jumps in and reversibly turns into pyruvate. Now, we want ultimately to get glucose, but pyruvate can't go backwards. In actual fact, there's 10 steps in this glycolysis pathway to go from glucose to pyruvate. And you can see I've only written a couple. These are the non-reversible, which means all the other steps can go backwards, but here they get caught up. So spe specific or special things need to happen in order for that to go to that, that to go to that, that to go to that. We'll talk about it. So pyruvate, lactates turns to pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, turns into acetyl-CoA, usually. But in this case, pyruvate's going to turn into oxaloacetate. Now oxaloacetate is needed to bind with acetyl-CoA in order for the Krebs cycle to happen, produce carbon dioxide, produce ATP, produce hydrogen, all right? But in this case, oxaloacetate needs to turn to glucose and it does it by turning into malate first and then malate leaves the cell. Now when malate leaves the cell, it turns back into oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate couldn't leave the mitochondria, that's what I meant, the mitochondria, not the cell. Once it's oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate jumps into this cycle here. And it will go through a couple of backward steps, going back, back, back until it gets caught up at fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It can't go backwards to glucose 6-phosphate. So we need an enzyme, and this enzyme is called fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And what it does is it can turn that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to one step back. Then it's gonna keep going back until boom, it gets caught up again at glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate will travel into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it's gonna come across an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase. And what it does is it turns glucose 6-phosphate into glucose. And what this glucose can now do 
is it can exit the hepatocyte. And what do we get? We get an increase in blood glucose levels. That's exactly what we wanted. So this is just from lactate coming in from the muscle, turns to pyruvate, turns into, well, jumps into the mitochondria and turns into oxaloacetate, which turns into malate, which jumps back out of the mitochondria, turns back into oxaloacetate, jumps into this glycolytic pathway, tries to go backwards, but gets caught at fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase comes along, helps it go backwards, keeps going backwards till it gets caught again at glucose 6-phosphate, which then jumps into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, hits this enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase, which then turns it to glucose and it can leave the cell. That's lactate. What happens with fats? Well, we know that triglycerides are made up of glycerol and fatty acids. Now, here we've got a glycerol backbone with three fatty acids. That's what a triglyceride is. So you relieve one glycerol and you've got three fatty acids. Now, glycerol will jump into this process here as well. And again, the same thing happens as what happened with lactate. It goes back all through that, this process until we create glucose and it's back out of the system. Perfect. So that means the glycerol from triglycerides will turn into glucose if needed under gluconeogenesis. What happens to the fatty acids? Well, the fatty acids, they can jump into the mitochondria and they can turn into acetyl-CoA. Now acetyl-CoA cannot turn into glucose, but it can turn into something else. We'll talk about that in a second. What about proteins? Well, we've got these amino acids. And amino acids, such as alanine and glutamate, for example, what they can do is they can jump into this pathway at different phases. They can jump in here, and that's gonna go through that same pathway before. It can jump here. It can jump down here as well. So we know that proteins and amino acids can ultimately turn into glucose as well. Now what happens if somebody's a diabetic? Well if somebody's a diabetic what can happen is this process of breaking down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids occur over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because there's very low levels of glucose and more specifically very low levels of insulin, almost absent insulin. Absent insulin is a trigger to stimulate this breakdown process. Now the fatty acids are turning into acetyl-CoA. That's being pumped out. Glycerol is going into this process here, right? So as pyruvate comes down to turn into acetyl-CoA, we've got heaps of acetyl-CoA being made, and in order for that to turn into energy, ATP, it needs to bind to oxaloacetate. But you know that when glucose is low, oxaloacetate leaves the mitochondria to turn into glucose. So there's actually not much oxaloacetate for this acetyl-CoA to bind to. So acetyl-CoA just builds up, builds up, builds up, and they actually stack on top of each other. When they stack on top of each other, they produce something called ketones. Two major types, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And what these ketones do is they can leave the hepatocyte, they can go to the brain, and the brain can turn it into glucose for energy. Wonderful. But what can also happen is when you produce ketones, you also produce acid. And an individual with type 1 diabetes who is not being managed with insulin, so the insulin is zero, means they get ketones and acid, and that's called ketoacidosis. That's not very good. So what do we have? We've got the process of gluconeogenesis. What triggered it? Low glucose. What was the outcome? High glucose. What else was playing a role? The hormones glucagon, cortisol, and noradrenaline. And what were the substrates for it? Lactate, amino acids, and triglycerides, specifically glycerol.